Chances are, much of what you know about Reconstruction is wrong, because the story of Reconstruction has been told for many different purposes. For generations, the story of Reconstruction was that it was a terrible mistake to believe that people just coming out of slavery could live as free citizens. Now we understand, no, the story of Reconstruction is a great democratic experiment in which people made freedom for themselves out of virtually nothing. One of the first things that we, we all need to know about Reconstruction is that African Americans were at the center of it. Here was a moment of possible transformation. For the first time, African Americans were able to build their own separate institutions. Here was a moment where you could help a nation live up to its stated ideals of fairness and equality. Reconstruction is not just a moment in our history, a chapter in the textbook but instead was a drama that enacts the fundamental struggles, dilemmas, contradictions of our democracy. Welcome to Teaching the Unvarnished Truth, Reconstruction and its Legacies. We're gathering here to discuss the importance of teaching Reconstruction and telling the unvarnished truth as well-known historian John Hope Franklin exhorted us. To prime our minds for this evening's discussion, we just heard three historians share thoughts about what is most important about Reconstruction. We'll continue through our conversation tonight to talk about what is important to know about Reconstruction, why we should know about Reconstruction, and how do we help others, especially students, learn about Reconstruction. My name is Kendra Flanagan, and I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning in the Education Department of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. 
Joining me tonight is my co-facilitator, Paul Gardulo, writer, historian, and curator, also at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He recently served as the project director for the NMAAHC exhibition, Make Good the Promises, Reconstruction and Its Legacies, and is currently co-directing an international exhibition and public history project entitled In Slavery's Wake, Slavery, Race, and the Making of Our World that focuses on history, on the history and afterlives of slavery, colonialism, and charts pathways towards anti-racist futures. Thanks, Paul, so much for being here. Kendra, it's great to be here. I'm really excited for this conversation tonight and talk about the history and the continuing importance of Reconstruction um, for our museum, because essentially the story of Reconstruction is one for that is essential for our museum, not just essential in terms of an exhibition, but almost central to the way our museum was built and the way we came to being. And I think when we think about the story of Reconstruction and the way in which we try to tell that story in the exhibition, Make Good the Promises, you see the heart and soul of what the National Museum of African American History and Culture is all about. First of all, it's an educational institution and we see education in the broadest sense um, as a, as a as a venue, as a place, as a vehicle for learning for all people in all spaces, not just in K to 12 classrooms, which is essential, not just in higher education, but in our public places and spaces. And so tonight, what I'd really like for us to think about is what happens when you, as Dr. Edna Green Medford said in that first clip, what happens when you centralize the African-American experience when thinking about the story of Reconstruction. What does that do for us when we look at this history and its legacies through an African-American lens? And I think we'll learn from our panelists tonight that it fundamentally changes the way we think about our history and ourselves. Thanks. So at the top of the hour, as you just mentioned, we heard from three historians, Dr. Edna Medford Green, Dr. Edward Ayers, and the Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie G. Bunch III. In addition to the pearls of wisdom that they shared, we're joined in real time by a group of powerful educators and historians. I'll give a short introduction here of everyone, but if you wanna know more about them, check their fuller bios on our event page. And I'll start off joining us tonight. We have Jesse Hagopian from the Zen Education Project, where he is a founding member of the Black Lives Matter at School campaign. We're also joined by Jeremy Nessoff from Facing History and Ourselves, where he's the director of District Partnerships. We are also joined this evening by Kurt Russell, the 2022 National Teacher of the Year. He's an advocate for classrooms to better reflect the students within them, both within the curriculum and the teaching teams. And last but not least, Dr. Kadada E. Williams, Associate Professor of History at Wayne State University, where she teaches about African-American and U.S. history. And she is also an author and an amazing podcast host of Season Freedom. Thank you all for being with us today. I want to kick us off and get everybody's voice into the space with an icebreaker question. So quick round, Robin, what draws you to this, to the study of the period of reconstruction as a scholar, an educator, or a lifelong learner, and I'll just let anybody can jump off and kick, 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 kick us off with the answer. Thank you so much for that introduction, for being here this afternoon. What drives me to continue to learn and speak about reconstruction is just the strong connection um, that it has currently. Um, so as I look at reconstruction, as I look at the questions that Reconstruction posed. Questions such as a human rights issue, uh, questions such as a political issue, how relevant is that even today? And so it's so exciting for me as a high school teacher to try to introduce current events and to relate that to Reconstruction. So once again, that brings me joy in teaching Reconstruction. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I'll go. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
So I would say that it's what draws me to Reconstruction is African Americans' bold actions during the war and afterwards, specifically their insistence that um, freedom didn't just mean their release from bondage, it meant all the rights they had been denied, and they fought for that. And that's exactly the opposite of the history that I learned in school. But it's the history that I teach my students and anyone I encounter. Thank you. I want to I want to second that is is one of the most attractive things about this period when you begin to really look at it is the amazing stories of everyday people, African Americans making ways out of no way, individually, collectively, in all arenas of life, from politics to community building to personal expression and sort of freedom making to finding families who they had lost for for a generation um it is really an amazing story of fortitude of democracy of overcoming and 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 the result of it is an incredible crime that we don't know this story and that the strides toward equality as kidata was saying that were made were stripped away no doubt. No doubt. I, I really think that this time period holds the keys to unlock our freedom. And in the struggles that we're involved in today, we need the lessons of the Black Freedom Movement during Reconstruction. But there's a more personal reason that I'm really drawn to this era, because last summer, my dad, Gerald Lenoir, made a stunning discovery, and he found out which plantation our family had been enslaved on the Lenoir Plantation in Morgantown, Mississippi. And he was able to find a picture of my great, great grandma, Laura Lenoir. And she had she was born on that plantation in 1852, which was the same year that Frederick Douglass delivered his seminal speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, right? And so, uh, you know, I was just really struck by the fact that she was 13 years old when the Civil War ended and she got free, the same age as my son is right now. And so she lived through this period of reconstruction. And that's uh, the, my relative that I can trace back uh, the furthest. Right. So she saw this reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow. And I just have so many questions that I would love to be able to ask her and to know about her life. And I wish that in my own education, this I had learned about Reconstruction and that it been able to connect with my own life. And I just want to make that commitment to teach my own students about this era. It's powerful. Thank you. Um, I guess that uh, is me. And I just want to first say um, that it's such a pleasure to be here. I've learned so much from the museum, from the other folks on this panel, and to be in the presence of a teacher of the year, a true celebrity, um, is just wonderful. Uh, I would say for me, looking back, it be my interest in this time began in high school and the realization and the true outrage of the false narratives that I was raised on, the realization mm -hmm. of what a turning point reconstruction was in US history and what could have been and was very painful to understand. And I think facing history in ourselves where I work and as I was a teacher and administrator um, using their material for me is so important because the question I think for each of us individually and particularly for those who are educators about our responsibility um, is how does this history challenge me? What is my responsibility as an educator, as a citizen, as a white man? And, you know, I think the drama of this time, the primary sources that you have in your exhibit um, that I've learned about from uh, Kadada, Dr. Williams and others, um, it's just an incredibly powerful, dramatic moment that teaches us so much about our world today. Well, thank you all. I, so many uh, just wonderful phrases and comments and thoughts have just come from what you all have shared. And just to add my, my thinking of what draws me to the study of reconstruction is often um, as I'm thinking about it, I just think about that moment of opportunity, being on that precipice of opportunity, 
both for the individuals that were living through that time period, but then also for the nation and how many of the questions that were happening during the time of reconstruction are questions that are still happening today. And I think that there's something about that that just keeps me going back to wanting to understand more about that time period and why were some things left on the table? Why were some things, you know, maybe made it a little bit, you know, a little bit of progress if we use that term and then other things just were completely uh, just not addressed, you know, and I think that that has been something that continually draws me back to the period of reconstruction. Um, that and then I think to connect with what Dr. Williams said, that resiliency of the African American uh, community and the individuals that lived through this time period. So I am really thrilled that I, I already see the beginnings and the foundations for a really great conversation for the rest of our time together. I'd like to move us into our first kind of segment that we'll we'll do and we'll talk about. And for that, if I could pull Jeremy and Jesse and Kurt to kind of stay with me on camera and we'll talk a little bit. And then um, uh, Paul and Kadata, we'll see you all in just a little bit. We're chat a little bit of school stuff here. Um, so Jesse, I want to start with you and a question for you that I had um, last year or a couple of years ago. I know that Zen Education Project began the hashtag Teach Reconstruction campaign and has also completed a report on the state of teaching reconstruction across the country. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and then tell us like what was one of the biggest takeaways? For sure, for sure. You know, we recently released this report on reconstruction and how it's taught and what the state standards are across the country. And the report begins with a quote from our panelists here today, Dr. Kanata Williams. And she said, quote, it's time for a new reconstruction story, a story that will help us better understand how we got here, a story where the central characters are black people who fought to liberate themselves, who gained political power despite every attempt at violent suppression. And that's really the idea that guided the whole construction of the port report, which was co-authored by Anna Rosado and Gideon Cohn Pastor and Mimi Eisen. And the report is called Erasing the Black Freedom Struggle, How State Standards Fail to Teach the Truth About Reconstruction. And it is the first comprehensive study of all state standards on reconstruction. Hmm. And the biggest takeaway from the report is that the vast majority of states have established educational standards which ignore the role of white supremacy in ending reconstruction and they reproduce a racist and false framing of Reconstruction uh, and obscure the contributions of Black people to Reconstruction's achievement. So only Massachusetts, right? Massachusetts is the only state that mentions white supremacy, right? And it's direct link to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the passage of the Black Clothes, the Jim Crow laws, and the defeat of Reconstruction, right? And then you have examples like Georgia, uh, Georgia's standards of excellence, which instruct teachers to, quote, compare and contrast the goals and outcomes of the Freedmen's Bureau and the Ku Klux Klan, right? And I think that asking students to compare these two different organizations creates a very dangerous false moral equivalency. Right. So in many states, reconstruction only appears on a list of topics or themes uh, for a particular time span. But but check this out. Uh, in Maine, reconstruction doesn't even merit that much space. Right. Maine standards def define the period as 1844 to 1877 as, quote, regional tensions and the Civil War and Connecticut two leaves out reconstruction altogether on its list of themes like westward expansion or industrialization or the rise of organized labor. So I, I think what we're seeing across the country is an invisibilizing reconstruction 
And then when it is mentioned, uh, often a mischaracterization. Mm. That's powerful. You have gotten us into much of the heart of this. And I, I would like to just thank you for sharing, I think, some examples too coming from the survey, uh, the report, because I think it's really helpful for us to understand. I think it's one thing to say, oh, reconstruction is not taught well, but to understand what that really does mean, you know, mm -hmm. what's being codified in the standards and what is then, I think, being encouraged or not encouraged um, for classroom teachers. And we, we know often that classroom teachers, right, are they're pushed for time. There's a lot that they're being asked to do. They only have a set amount of time with the students. And when they are, you know, when it's suggested that perhaps something isn't, you know, this is not a priority or it's not important to teach, they're going to go on to the next thing. And I think it's really important to have some way for us to be able to um, codify and understand really what is happening in the different states with the standards. And I think with that, I want to turn and ask Kurt a question. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, and I, I know Jeremy and Jesse, you all probably have something uh, to say on this question as well, so please do chime in. We'll kick it off with Kurt first. Though. Why, why can reconstruction be a challenge to teach for so many classroom educators? You know what, what a great question. And just to piggyback off of Jesse, what he mentioned so eloquently is that number one, I see a problem with resources um, in regards to that many teachers who have not maybe gained that particular lesson in college or received that information is really facing their understanding of reconstruction on textbooks, right? And so we know that textbook just give a, a summary, a skim, and it's not really in depth. And I think teachers are really challenged with not being able to eloquently um, discuss reconstruction in its entirety. Um, in its very vast understanding of race relation, political ramification, economic ramification, socially. And so that has a lot to do with it as well. But I think number two, the challenges that teachers are facing is fear. Um, our country is so polarized, especially when it comes to discussing race. So when we discuss race in America as a teacher, one of the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is CRT. And so if you discuss systematic racism that came out of Reconstruction, you will have teachers being afraid to, to mention that out of fear, retaliation in regards to maybe the community is not welcoming those type of conversations, um, a fear of jobs. I know that there are some policies, some states who are pushing not to mention systematic racism or racism, period or white privilege. And I think that has a lot to do with teachers being strapped, um, teachers are being in a pigeonhole, not being able to express uh, vividly the impact of reconstruction, not only in the 1860s, but most definitely today as well. Yeah, that's, that, that, those are real, um, those real situations and concerns and challenges that we've been hearing about uh, from many teachers that have uh, interacted with us either around Make Good the Promises Reconstruction Exhibition or just even um, with some of the other work that we've been doing from the museum. Uh, we're hearing from teachers that sometimes, you know, the language that's used in there or the fact that it is something that has to, uh, you know, it is a, it's a resource or it's a topic that, you know, connects with race in some way that it has made it, um, it's been a challenge for them to be able to bring that into their classroom. And I hope that, you know, as we're having these conversations tonight and as we're kind of talking through some of these questions and our thinking, that there will be some ways that we can uh, offer and share with educators of what are the different ways that they can teach about this topic what we are hoping, right, is that we're helping to give them supports, whether it's through sources, whether it's through, I know, Kurt, one of the things that you mentioned is that sometimes educators themselves don't have a good enough foundation within that time period, within Reconstruction and within the time periods that surround it to be able to feel comfortable 
to teach about reconstruction. And so that's something that we also hope that we'll be able to shed some light on and some resources and things that educators can look towards. Um, we'll be you know, sharing some links with educators uh, via our event page, as well as uh, sending some things after uh, the program so that uh, educators will have uh, some of these links right at their fingertips, but uh, links from all of you all's organizations that we'll be talking about, as well as some other uh, primary sources that we think may really help educators as they're moving into the classroom space and moving into these conversations to sometimes what we have found really can help an educator is that when you're using the primary sources, they're revealing what the history is. The teacher does not have to draw those lines and connections. The primary sources are telling it verbatim what was happening at that period. So. Um, we'll be sharing some of those uh, as well with our audience members. I want to I want to um, also continue to I want to continue to connect with a comment that you made, uh, Kurt, as well about educators and their their foundation. And I'm throwing this out to everybody. Why do you think it's important for or is it important for educators to consider their own understanding of reconstruction? And if you do think it's important, tell me why. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's really important to, to teach this time period. And, and too often when reconstruction gets taught at all, it gets taught from a framework of the Dunning School narrative as, as a failure, right? Without understanding, one, the immense gains that were made towards democracy and racial justice, but then also how reconstruction didn't just fail, it was violently attacked by the forces of white supremacy, right? That were led by the Democratic Party and its terrorist wing, the Ku Klux Klan. And, and then on the flip side, you have other teachers who only teach about the Ku Klux Klan and the violent white supremacist attacks on reconstruction without fully exploring with students the revolutionary advancements that were made uh, towards democracy in this era. And so I, I want students to know that Reconstruction was a time when the impossible suddenly became possible, right? Like mm. the historian David Rodiger wrote, uh, quote, if, if anything seemed impossible in the 1850s political universe, it was the immediate unplanned and uncompensated emancipation of 4 million slaves. And I want students to know the incredible leap forward in democracy and racial justice that occurred during the era of Reconstruction, right? The, the fact that you had formerly enslaved people uh, become uh, uh, senators, right? Uh, it was a moment when the black majority legislature in South Carolina could tax the rich to pay for public schools and black people built the public school system across across the country, right, uh, and across the South, right. It just some of the most incredible stories come out of this time period that help uh, students see how we could create uh, movements for racial and social justice today. That's yeah, um, one one thing I'll add, if I can, Kendra, um, about why it's important for educators to consider their own understanding is because we grew up and were educated in this country. <laughs> and therefore, a lot of our own education was severely lacking in understanding Reconstruction. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, in New York, uh, in the 1980s is when I went to high school. And I definitely had an, an exceptional story about the United States and our reaching our ideals and always progress, perpetual progress towards those ideals. And so that's why when, as I mentioned before, when I learned about the things that Jesse was just mentioning and Kurt was just mentioning, it was this true moment of outrage and it was a shock. So I think educators, before they attempt to teach this history, really need to reflect on their own experiences, what was missing in our own education and trying to address the gaps in our own knowledge and understanding before we enter into conversations with students. Mm. It's powerful, yeah. And I really, think it, yeah, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Um, I think it's also so important uh, for our understanding to validate voices. 
Um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times in history, we do not validate voices or those who might be marginalized or those who are oppressed. And I think understanding that, especially through the study of reconstruction, it's a great opportunity for our young students, especially our students of color, to feel validated. Um, the resilience of these individuals who journeyed through reconstruction, who was terrorized and came out um, you know, stronger than they were before. And I think that's so important as a learning lesson for our students as well the idea of resilience, overcoming situations, giving voices and validating one own experiences. Yeah. Powerful. All that you all have said is, are, is, is really resonating with me. I, I was making notes as you all were talking and wrote down when the impossible suddenly became possible and thinking like, what is, you know, putting, putting my, my mind into that moment. Um, as you spoke and that just that that phrase just really was resonating with me and I wanted to write that down and then Kurt you were saying the validating the voices and thinking Jeremy about the the teachers and like coming out of their own educational system and what they may or may not have learned and then how that you know impacts what they then are going forward to to teach about if if they're if educators are able to really kind of consider and think about and interrogate their own understanding and move into that space where they're able to then do what you were saying, Jesse, and looking at both the, the obscuring that was happening with white supremacy and, and racism, but also looking at the great uh, moments of opportunity and growth that happened within Reconstruction, during the Reconstruction time period within the African-American community, and then circling back around to the validating voices in this contemporary time space with the students that are in front of them in their classroom and how powerful that, that whole arc is um, for educators to students and thinking about what it is to bring the past and the present to, con you know, to connect and move into our future. Thank you all for sharing um, all of those thoughts. I, I, wanna, I wanna circle back to, to Jeremy and ask him a question. Um, really that his, I, I was inspired by a resource out of Facing History and ourselves uh, called, called the Reconstruction Era and the Fra Fragility of Democracy. Um, as we were getting ready to plan for this exhibition, it was one of the first resources. And I think, in fact, Paul was the one who brought it to me. Paul brought it to me and he said, here you go, Kander, educator on the exhibition, here you go. <laughs> he handed it to me. And it has been, it, it was an inspiration as I was thinking about what uh, educational components could be a part of the exhibition. And I would like to uh, just have you talk to us a little bit about what the resource is and then because I know that it predated some of this, like, you know, what's happened in the last couple of years where there's an explosion in talking about reconstruction. What was the motivation for you all at the time? Where, what were you all thinking about as you thought, let's focus on this era? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, so it was 2015 that we published that unit, and um, it does feel like a different time, to be honest. Uh, those six years, quite a lot has happened, quite a lot that is good in terms of learning about this history and teaching about it, and uh, quite a lot that's disturbing about the, revealing the fragility of our own form of democracy. You know? And so at Facing History and Ourselves, um, our mission is to challenge students and teachers with the lessons to use the lessons of history to challenge students and teachers to stand up to bigotry and hate uh, so as in all of our units uh, we look at history to study how ideals of freedom equality and justice the ideals that we all claim to hold in our country um, how they have not been reached and when they have not been reached and how they require constant vigilance and active participation Democracy has never achieved. It's always a work in progress and it requires guardians. And in this history and reconstruction, we can see stories of upstanders, as Jesse and others have alluded to, um, a legacy of black activism, self um, agency, self determination, resistance that holds lessons for us all because this is all our history. So as with other units of Facing History is created, including our foundational case on the Holocaust and human behavior, we look at moments when these ideals that we hold were assaulted, when democracy was put at risk and if not destroyed, um, or if not destroyed. So uh, the Reconstruction Era, as we've acknowledged in the videos and, and with other comments here, is literally necessary to understand our country today. And that's one reason why we did it. 
it also is an incredible time to teach the lesson of historiography, to see how literally memory and history themselves are vulnerable and can be used and misused by leaders to unleash racial hatred, um, to justify discrimination and deny liberty. So we want to look at these moments with our students so that we can see, for example, how the, the vein, the sickness, the reality of white supremacy that we all have lived with and through our history is, is here today and how it impacts us. How could we possibly understand a connection between the massacre at the Hall of North Mass in New Zealand or the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh or the Mother Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina if we don't understand white supremacy and its impact? How can we understand the symbols of racism and white supremacy at January, at the insurrection in January 6th? Um, so understanding the history is necessary for understanding our country, for understanding the impacts of white supremacy. And as I mentioned, for understanding what happens when we stand up by looking at those who have stood up in history um, in some of the most difficult moments uh, that hopefully will give us examples of what we can do today to stand up against bigotry and hate today. Um, so I would say that's the, the big, that was the big goal at the time. And, you know, to be honest, it's something that we're constantly coming back to thinking of improving. Um, the title, The Fragility of Democracy at the time, um, seemed accurate and a good one and, and is a true theme of how facing history approaches all history. Um, but I do think it's time, just as the paradigm shifts that I've experienced in my life that have really, I hope, opened my eyes. Um, another one I think we need to start asking is, is when did this democracy that we talk about begin? And, you know, when can we make an argument for achieving it? Um, so those are some thoughts just about why we created the union in 2015. Thank you. It's been, it's been an, an inspirational resource and we're going to be able to share the link as well, um, both to Erasing the Black Freedom Struggle from Zen Education Project and the Reconstruction Era and the Fragility of Democracy uh, to make sure that educators and the audience members that are with us are able to um, really take some time and go through and read at their own pace, but then also be able to think of ways to bring the information that you all are sharing uh, in those resources into their classroom and into their academic spaces, whether it's with their students or sharing it with their colleagues. So thank you all for that. And I, I wanted, um, I know uh, Jesse and Jeremy, we were kind of in the exhibition around the same time and we really had a really stimulating discussion about the periodization for reconstruction that's in our timeline. And so I wanted to toss a question to Paul, who served as project director on the exhibition. Um, so Paul, if you're there, um, in the exhibition in the book, the, the timeline that we have, it goes from 1861 to 1896. And I know, Jesse, you referenced some of the periodization in one of your uh, comments early, in an earlier question. We often see the traditional timeline is kind of given as 1865 to 1877 or you know give or take a year here or there but paul can you talk a little bit to us about what we gain when we look at reconstruction with a longer view of time wow i can but first i just want to say you know like i want to stay in the church of jesse kurt and and jeremy Preach, okay. brothers, because this is, you know, what, what we are hearing tonight is essential, essential learning um, for us all. It's the, the, what we're hearing from you all is the kind of work that we need to be doing, right? And the kind of language that we need to hear and speak to each other, that, that our work is ongoing it's rooted in history, but it's connected to our everyday lives today, and it matters. And so thank you for that. Um, and time matters, Kendra. And I think time matters in multiple ways for us when we're talking about reconstruction. It's in I think it matters extending the timeline to begin with where you began, right? Extending the timeline from 1865 through the end of the 19th century allows us to do a couple simple things, right? It allows us to talk about this period in both its hopefulness and the aspirational qualities of this period and the work that was done toward creating the world's first 
biracial or multiracial democracy, right? We too, the reconstruction and the and the work of Black people in driving the narrative of equality helped to craft and recraft our nation, as you know, Eric Foner has called it a, a second revolution, right? It helps us to tell that narrative, but it also helps us to tell that equally important narrative that that Jesse and others were referring to that retrenchment, that turning away, that violent uh, that the violence that held back our our work toward um, making good the promises uh, that are in part of our rebirthed constitution. Right, that Frederick Douglass exhorts the Republican National Convention to do in 1876, as he's seeing all of that promise stripped away. And so, when we when we begin to expand the timeline, we begin to see this period as a wellspring for us, both of hope and of extreme pain. And 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 that and that continues. That arc continues to today. And I have, and, and I think that we wanted to tap into that in ways that could be accessed by, by all sorts of people, whether you knew the history, whether you didn't, but also let, did so in a way that didn't contain that period of time to a safe place in the past, that did the work of connecting the key issues of then to the key issues of now. And I guess what I'd really like to do is pivot a little bit and, and, and bring Kidada into the mix and, and ask Dr. Williams a little bit about that. And, and not just about the periodization, but about this notion of this period as a wellspring um, and as a wellspring of optimism and hope and as a wellspring of pain and violence. And that is a, I'm hearing the, you know that for us as historians is re a really a really enormously important place to be but it's become an increasingly challenging place i'm hearing for teachers to be and teachers who are really trying to bring history to their students and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe your understanding of that how to navigate those two that tension that's involved there and in order to bring out what we need to bring out from this period for, for teachers and students? Well, I think that's a great question, Paul. I think one of the best ways to address this is to acknowledge the fact that, you know, there are people who will call these CRT bills, but I actually call them white comfort bills, right? Because they're designed to sort of ensure that white students and white students are comfortable in the classroom. And they have shown the complete disregard for the ways that uh, harmful histories have hurt, um, have actually hurt black and brown students in the classroom. And so I think understanding what's happening is important. It's the first thing to do. But then understanding what your options are. You know, teachers' hands aren't completely tied here. I think one of the things that they can do is to focus on a variety of sources and to sort of be mindful or cautious about how they frame those sources. So I would say, for example, you know, we talked about uh, stretching the time period. I also think one of the things we really need to do is to sort of rethink the geography of Reconstruction. And so yeah. look at, for example, what white Northerners and Westerners you know, where they stood. So you get a variety of perspectives. So you don't just look at what's happening in the South. You look, for example, at how white Westerners and Northerners, how they voted on the Reconstruction Amendments, um, what their lawmakers said, what their newspapers covered. And then you let the students see the records for themselves. And then you help them, you sort of, you know, like, what do you see here? What kind of world do they seem to be trying to build? And then what does that tell us about them? what they tried and what actually happened. So I think there are a variety of options and there are a lot of resources that are available. A lot of them are available online and other resources could be available simply by contacting librarians, for example, to access newspapers, um, that sort of discuss the reconstruction amendments and the votes as it goes through the process of ratification. There are a lot of options out there. And those options that are out there not only reveal a diversity of 
sort of like perspective during the time period. But I also think they help the students understand that moment and see similarities between the past and present. And teachers don't always have to spell that out to them. They can sort of let students examine the records for themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you, you I, I think dipping into and letting the, the archive speak for itself is, is vital. I think also expanding the archive Right, and how we think about what is actually available is and and resourceful is vital as well. One of the archives that you've really spent a, a lot of time in is a, is an archive of anti-black violence and the crimes perpetrated against African Americans um, during the period of Reconstruction. Um, and I, and I wonder what you think about, what, what you might say to teachers about the value of, of bringing that history, some might call a, a hard history. I don't necessarily think a truthful history needs to be hard, but it's important for people to come to, to face this, especially when we're thinking about one of the legacies of the failure of reconstruction being the persistent drumbeat of anti-Black violence. Um, continuing right up through the 21st century. So how, how do you think about that in terms of teaching, especially teaching young people? So I think one of the things to do is to look at the diversity of records that are available. So you, for anti-Black violence, you've got all of these testimonies and affidavits, but embedded within those testimonies are stories of how much African-Americans actually accomplished mm -hmm. during Reconstruction. You know, so they're targeted for a reason. They're targeted because they were actually very good at seizing their freedom. Um, and that narrative, and that actually challenges a, a sort of problematic single story about Reconstruction, which is that it just failed, um, as a number of people have alluded to. But those testimonies give, they sort of make clear that the ways that Reconstruction was violently overthrown and then abandoned by the rest of the country. And so what I favor is teaching a dis sort of disruptive history, a history that disrupts the common narratives, a history that disrupts the single stories, the simple kind of what I would call kindergarten stories that um, K through 12 students are still receiving. So it makes sense in kindergarten, right? But what my students report is that they're still receiving that kind of simple story, even when they get to high school. Yes. And that doesn't prepare them to understand the world we live in. And none of it actually makes sense to them. So they actually have a lot of questions. So I think you can teach the history. I think you just have to sort of think about what's age appropriate for students. Um, some of the testimonies are actually quite graphic and quite devastating. I think teachers should be, should be mindful of the kinds of sources they're using and why and how. Um, and so the work is there to be done. There are too many records available to not cover this history. And so but teachers have to be thoughtful about what they're doing and why as they sort of dig into the record. I think that's brilliant. I, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, somebody's commenting in the, in the chat. I love Dr. Williams's podcast. I love it too. One of the things that we talked about when we were in conversation together on your podcast was the, the power of culture, the power of art. And, and cultural expression in shaping um, in, in shaping things negatively or positively. And, and I wonder if you might, if I might ask you a question about that, because when Jesse mentioned the Dunning School earlier, and the Dunning School, for those of you who do not know, is a, is a school of history coming out of Columbia um, that is perpetrating a myth. And it perpetrates a myth of the lost cause for decades throughout the 20th century. And it's not just professional historians who are perpetrating this myth of, uh, of a bloodless version of slavery, of people coming out of emancipation, you know, people who have determined that emancipation does not equal full freedom and finding and attaining their full freedom, right? And, and the Dunning School is perpetrating a myth of black bestiality, of ignorance, of all sorts of racist stereotypes. And they're, it's complemented by this incredibly powerful cultural machine, Hollywood, right? Um, monuments. And I'm, and I'm struck by the enduring power of culture and fostering that myth that has shaped 
many, many of us. And I'm wondering what you think about the power of cultural expression and art um, to tell a different story uh, and, and to tell a different, and, and what we can do about that as historians and as teachers. Right. So I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is that just as you've got the Dunning School, what you have is African-Americans at the time creating a counter narrative to the lost cause story, you know, this mythology of reconstruction. African-Americans not only create these records themselves, you know, and teachers can look at them. They can look at the, they can look at the state constitutions that the Southern state constitutions that African-Americans helped rewrite to get an understanding of the era. They can look at the legislation, the civil rights bills and the reconstruction amendments to understand this era. But they can also look at the sort of sort of heavy cultural work African-Americans did to keep the memory of the era alive. Because right. after Reconstruction was overthrown and abandoned, it was African-Americans who never let go of their understanding of this powerful moment. And they passed that legacy, they passed that understanding on from one generation to the next. And that knowledge was how you know future generations would continue to fight for their freedom. You know, Africa, so, you know, Jesse talked about, you know, the, the, the Black freedom struggle. The Black freedom struggle comes about or it's sustained by an understanding of what was created during this moment and then what was lost and that the nation still owed, the nation still had a debt. And African-Americans were determined to make sure that the debt was paid in full. So they continued to pass on that knowledge. They created, you know, great histories of Black Reconstruction. You can see this in a lot of the print culture, but you see it in, um, you know, like the plays, the exhibitions, the history exhibitions that were done in schools um, throughout the South, not just the North and West, but throughout the South. And so they keep this memory alive through their art, through their writing, through their politics, through their action, and through passing this memory on from one generation to the next. And so what they don't have is the sort of larger capital that the white supremacists have. So they've got, you know, white supremacists have control over the machinery of, you know, of popular culture. African Americans don't have complete control, but that doesn't mean that they are sitting there passive and helpless. You know, you've got Birth of a Nation, but you also have Oscar Micheaux's Within Our Gates. You've got the Klansmen, but you also have all of those novels um, and stories that black, um, black artists and black writers and black historians are writing about this period too. So it's, you know, we have to sort of understand that African-Americans are not passive during this period. Um, and we can look to them, we can understand who they were and what mattered to them um, and the legacies they passed on to future generations just by looking at all of the records that are available to us. Yeah, and I think that, that thank you for that history lesson. And and you, it was so it was it was a lot and succinct. But I think that 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 continues today, right? That that narrative, that truth telling narrative, that reclamation of Black Reconstruction is something that continues today. It continues in the work of the of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It continues in the work of artists and i might you know i might even sort of want to pause it in a way this is our lost cause for the 21st century helping to reclaim this narrative that has real power and i was i was it was just deeply inspired by by a quote that i heard from a poet natasha trethewey our our former poet laureate who said imagine if we had populated the landscape with monuments to black soldiers in the 50 years following, in the 100 years following the Civil War. How would we understand ourselves as a people if that had happened? That was a powerfully provocative sort of reimagining of a history that might have been. And, and to what I would say is still might be. And so we are in a moment where things still might be, even amidst our struggles, even amidst the failures that we're facing year to year, um, even it, it, watching our last six years, as as Jeremy said. So I'd like to pivot us, go, please, please go I, ahead. I just wanna interject really quickly by saying, and that is what the proponents of these white comfort bills are afraid of, right? Yes. 
you know, it's, you know, this history is not only appealing and interesting to Black Americans, it's appealing and interesting to all Americans and or to a great, or to a much greater variety of Americans who understand how powerful this moment was and what was gained and lost. And who, be, you know, because they have a sense and a belief in liberty and justice, they want to right these wrongs. And what the people who are behind these bills know is that if they can starve them of this history, if they can keep them ignorant, then they will remain passive. And so, you know, it, you know, so this is why, like, I think it's important for teachers to not give up. If African Americans can teach clandestine schools during slavery, then I think, you know, teachers can sort of think about to be ways to be really strategic about teaching this history and not losing this moment where it's not only about sort of um, advocating the interests of African Americans, but really protecting our very democracy. Like this, this requires constant vigilance. And I love the quote by, um, by James Baldwin, you know, he says, Americans like to think of liberty, freedom and democracy, you know, like a warm blanket or they like to use the terms, you know, so, you know, you can say you have it and you can sort of wrap yourself under the blanket and be comfortable and you can go to sleep, sleep in the comfort, you know, that you believe all of the work is done. But in reality, this requires constant work. You can't, you know, sit or hide under a comfortable warm blanket and protect our liberty and our freedom and our democracy. You have to be out there. But in order to be out there, you have to know, you have to be awake to the realities of the history and the realities of the present. Yeah, I love that. Always, always with, with James Baldwin. Let me bring our teacher into the mix here because we've been talking a little bit about what, what I would love to hear what, what Kurt, you think about. Um, what you're hearing from students, are these kinds of stories resonating with them? Are they, are you able to bring some of this and what are you hearing from them about connections to this kind of history and legacy? Well, first of all, I'm just so amazed and was so into this conversation um, that was happening. So thank you so much. Just being a ear um, listening has just been very influential. Absolutely correct in regards to um, my students feel as though some cases where we are discussing reconstruction is difficult, but I love the quote where it's okay to be uncomfortable or comfortable, forgive me, with being uncomfortable, right? It's okay. And so as we discuss reconstruction in my particular classroom, I'm very authentic, I'm very vulnerable in that discussion, but it must start with making sure that the classroom is safe. Safe in regards to making sure that it's trustworthy, making sure that students feel as though they have a voice, making sure that students feel validated in their thought process. And I don't think we could really tackle reconstruction. I don't think we could tackle race relations. I don't think we could tackle oppression, uh, violence, without making sure that the classroom is safe. Um, for that. And what do I mean by being safe? Well, being safe where it's not a judgmental discussion, it's a factual reading discussion. And so what do I mean by a reading discussion? I use primary sources in my um, study of Reconstruction. Listening to those who went through it is the best way for my students to learn about it. It's not necessarily through Kurt Russell giving a lecture on that, but through this Socratic method of reading, analyzing, listening to what those who experienced Reconstruction went through and for us to acknowledge it and for us to grow from it and for us to learn from it. And so my students are very much engaged, all of my students, black and brown students and my white students as well, because it's something where they could relate to. As I said earlier, it's so, powerful to discuss reconstruction and making a connection to that of today. And students find it so interesting as we look at our democracy today and relating that back to reconstruction. And um, from that aspect, my students are really honing in on it and they are really appreciative of this time period and making sure that we continue that hard work. And it takes all of us, all educators, 
to continue this hard work of uh, really reinforcing the magnitude of this period and making sure, as I said earlier, that voices are being listened to and heard. Yeah, and I think that's so, That thank you for that. And I think this, this, this is just deeply relevant and, you know, to so many aspects of our lives today um, in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, when you're thinking about matters of incarceration and race um, and continuing violence, but also continuing voting rights and, and voter struggles and, and myths being perpetrated and how we understand our past. And so one of the things that we really wanted to ensure with this exhibition was that reconstruction was not just a period, but it, it, people begin to understand it as a process. Yeah. And it's a process that they are participating in and that they can help shape, um, not just through memory, but through active work. And I'm gonna, Kurt, I'm gonna give you the last word and then I wanna show a small clip from back to Dr. Ayers, Dr. Medford Green and, and, and Lonnie Bunch. And Paul, once again, I apologize for interjecting, but I want to make sure that I'm clear that we also have to be authentic in regards to discussing this time period. Um, all of us are saying the same thing on this panel, that it cannot be this skim over type of lesson. It has to be authentic. And the only way we can do that is to make sure that our classroom is safe, um, that we have norms, that we are creating this environment for all students to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What we need to remember is that as we move forward as a nation, we're going to have to be constantly vigilant. In every generation, we're fighting the same battles over and over again because we don't have the will to address the issues that were there in Reconstruction. We cannot walk away any longer. So if Reconstruction teaches us anything, it is we have to resolve the problems now or we're never going to be able to move forward. Reconstruction grappled with the most fundamental problems of American democracy. What does justice look like? Who gets a say? What are fair laws? What's the role of the Constitution? How do you counter people who would use violence to deny democracy? Reconstruction is one of those moments that today should illuminate many of the challenges we face currently. Reconstruction was a time of partisanship, a partisan divide, much like today. Reconstruction was a time when there were great debates about the future of African Americans, the role of race in America, like today. So as you're seeing this exhibit and thinking about Reconstruction, realize that the stakes have never been higher and the conflict has never been greater. So I want us to think about um, this question about why Reconstruction matters today. And I want us to think about, you know, now that we have an exhibition going, now that that ending on Sunday, now that we have our works out in the world, how do we keep our work still moving forward. Why is this, I think we've all talked about the importance of the work, but how do we keep this front and center for people? And that, I think we're opening that up to the full, we're welcoming Kandra back in with, with Jesse and Jeremy and beginning an open kind of conversation and wrap up and move to q and I think I'll just say quickly that if we, if we want to understand the issues of today, any of the issues, voting rights, due process, equal protection under the law, citizenship, um, any of our social, civil, political, and legal rights, um, then we have to understand what happened during Reconstruction. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that, Dr. Williams. And I think the most important way to keep people's interest about reconstruction is to make it relevant to their lives today and to tell the really compelling stories of reconstruction uh, in a narrative form 
but but also connect it to what's happening uh, in our society today, right? And I really think that the era of reconstruction is the Rosetta Stone for understanding the attacks on black education that are happening right now, uh, the rise of white supremacist violence, and, 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 and for also understanding the Black Lives Matter movement today and the 2020 uprising. And I think that the the, the attacks on critical race theory that are happening are only legible through understanding the attacks on black education historically, right? And reconstruction was a time when black people built the public school system because they knew there was no emancipation without education. But it was also a time when white supremacists that I call educational arsonists used every tactic of terror they could to try to stop black education and advancement. Uh, and Frederick Douglass wrote, he said, quote, schoolhouses are burnt, teachers are mobbed and murdered, schools are broken up, right? There were over 600 schools that were burnt to the ground during Reconstruction because of their fear of Black education. And that that's really, I think, the same fear that is driving uh, the, the attack on any kind of anti-racist learning today because they saw the uprising of 2020 and millions of people, right, in the largest uprising in U.S. history, uh, as it was described by the Washington Post. And so many students saw the uprising and they went back into their classrooms and they demanded that their teachers have something to say about why racial violence is still occurring in our society. And they demanded that teachers have something to say about the history of the black freedom struggle. And, and, and I think that that transformed a lot of conversations in a lot of classrooms across the country. And uh, I think it's that, that striving that created the backlash that we're in right now. And I think it makes it all the more important that we, that we teach the real history of reconstruction. Um, I could jump in and say that um, a facing history class culminates in this idea of choosing to participate. And in the facing, in the unit on reconstruction, we center that discussion on teachers' responsibility and our duty to get this history right for our students. And I just think about uh, Paul's language around perpetuating a myth and Dr. Williams' language around nothing makes sense. Literally nothing makes sense in our world today understanding our country if we don't understand this history. And so I think for teachers and students, we can see how we can uncover local history. Um, Reconstruction is an American story that's anything south of the Canadian border. It's not a northern story or southern story or west. And I think students around the country could get excited about pushing back on the, the, the myths that have been perpetuated on all of us, centering Black voices and experiences in this history. Um, because it's our history and it can teach us uh, what happens when people stand up in the face of hatred and bigotry. And I would just like to echo with the other panelists in regards to why is this so important? Um, because our students deserve it. Uh, our students are participants of history and we are doing our students a misservice if we do not teach this time period in reference to the time period that we live in right now. And so it's so important for our students to continue to grow and to learn, to develop as young people. And how can we do that? How can we make sure that our students are socially, um, civically engaged is by them learning our true history. And I think our current situation that we are experiencing really starts with reconstruction. That's why it's so impactful. That's why it's so important. I've heard a bit of a through line that I would like to ask a question about, but I also want to, while I'm doing this and while we're answering this question, I wanna give um, our audience a chance to be thinking of some questions. Uh, 
we're going to roll into a, a period of Q&A where you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions uh, of our panelists here. So be thinking of something, put them into the chat and we'll be able to see them and uh, pass them on to our panelists so that we can continue to talk about some of your questions that you have. So to the question that I have right now for the through line that I've been hearing in our past hour of discussion that, we're, that we've been having is that educators, part of what we are looking or part of what we're seeing, part of what we know is important is educators having a strong foundation and feeling confident in their own knowledge and to take that into the classroom. So the learning that they need to do for themselves, the learning that they want to do for themselves so that they can help to bring those stories forward to their students. And I think in the way that we are talking about it, um, you know, in helping the more that the teachers are showing their own knowledge up, the better that they can go into the classroom, more confidently they can go into the classroom to create that safe and brave space with the norms, et cetera, and be able to then pass on the information to their students so their students can be that future and can be the ones that take us forward and make and, and become those actors and those um, history history makers uh, for, for our future. And so my question to the panelists here are what are some of the resources that you all can think of that educators can use to learn for themselves? Um, you know, thinking of educators, I always like to say in my role here at the museum as being the director of teaching and learning, one of my favorite audiences to work with are educators because I'm like, they're lifelong learners. They're, they're so hungry to learn themselves and then share it. And I love that concept. So what are some really specific resources that you all can think of that educators could use to, to learn from? I was sharing with Jeremy um, before online that I use facing history in ourselves. Um, within my classroom. I think it's very um, easy to follow. Um, the language is true, it's just, um, you know, the platform is easy for students to grab a hold to. And so that is a primary source I use. And also uh, within my classes, I love, as I said earlier in my conversation, I love primary sources. So uh, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, I even use um, you know, college and universities websites and I go there uh, because to understand reconstruction in my humble um, experience is to understand student, I'm sorry, individual voices. And I try to bring that to my classroom. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna suggest a great resource for teachers is a book called Make Good Promises. Uh, with contributions from our own Dr. Kadada Williams and several other amazing, um, amazing contributors. Kendra Flanagan is a contributor to that book. I think it's a wonderful resource for teachers to think about and dip into. For primary sources, I want to recommend. Uh, well, let me let me stick on the on the on subject matter. Uh, Dr. Kadada Williams has a new book coming out, and I want you to prime you to, to make mention of that. That should be published in 2022 or 2023, uh, coming out quite soon. Yeah, January 2023. And Ooh. there's a wonderful book by the historian Manisha Senia coming out on, on Reconstruction as well. So there is a rich, really new history coming out on documentary history. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau Project is a phenomenal way to get students involved in the, the, the primary sources. Our museum has been engaged in a project of um, transcribing and digitizing the records of the Freedmen's Bureau Project. Those are real life letters from people to Freedmen's Bureau Project officers uh, and, and workers. Um, that are documenting their lives in the immediate years following slavery. It is the real deal. And, uh, and people are finding out new information from this archive that only a handful of historians have, have been privy to for a generation or more. And right now this process of digitization is really democratizing history. And I think it will change the way we think about this period over the next 10, 20 years or so. So I'd recommend those. Wow. That's really exciting. 
to hear about. I, I just wanted to throw a few more resources uh, in the mix, especially for educators. Um, I want to suggest the resources of the Zen Education Project because we offer free downloadable interactive lesson plans about reconstruction, uh, also about the abolitionist movement, the Civil War, and so many other areas. But, you know, we have a lesson called Reconstructing the South, a role play. We have a lesson called When the Impossible Suddenly Became Possible, a Reconstruction Mixer. We have mm -hmm. one called 40 Acres and a Mule, role playing, role playing what reconstruction could have been. And then we have one called Who Killed Reconstruction, a trial. Mm -hmm. So the Zen Education uh, report also in, in the in the recently uh, released report, we have a whole section on resources that include lesson plans, books for different age groups, podcasts, uh, lectures and panels and films and digital archives. Um, so I want to recommend that resource as well. And I'll just, if I'll just oh sorry, Dr. Williams, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, one thing I was going to say is uh, absolutely second, third, and what a hundredth year podcast, Seizing Freedom, is amazing. Um, I would also add Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who's a contributor to Make Good the Promises, um, has a podcast called Teaching Hard History for Learning Justice, the Zen Education Project. Um, I would definitely uh, second and third. And uh, to get a recommendation from the Teacher of the Year, Kurt, um, for Facing History's resources is incredible. Uh, one thing I would mention as, as um, that impacted my own learning is the second founding by Eric Foner recently, and where he really focuses on the latent power and the original intent of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Um, we hear a lot about the original intent of the founders. We don't hear enough about the original intent of the African-American activists and their allies who helped create the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment um, and the latent power in those amendments. So um, I'll just throw those out there. Thank you. And I'll just quickly add, um, let's see, I'll do primary sources first. Uh, there are a lot of resources that are available digitally uh, that are available online, excuse me. So you can look at the Library of Congress. Um, they've got a lot of resources and they have a lot of teaching tools um, for educators, you can find that. There's the Free Men in Southern Society Project. They have a lot of records, but they also produce a lot of books that are available. So on families and freedom, et cetera. There is also the Valley of the Shadow Project. So that's for people who are in the Virginia region. It's a great resource with a lot of primary sources, letters, reports, et cetera. So that's a good place to look for material. Um, of course, Season Freedom. Um, but I would also add, like, I think that there are a couple of things to sort of keep in mind. One, there is a really good book out by Kate Mazur called Until Justice Be Done, which looks at mostly Northerners, particularly in the Midwest, um, their, how they go through the sort of movement of coming out of um, slavery going into Reconstruction. It's a really important book. And we haven't talked enough about the West here. And so I would also highly recommend um, Stacey Smith's Freedom's Frontier, which looks at the implications of reconstruction in a place like California, which would surprise people that California would be opposed to some of the reconstruction amendments based upon the mythology that Californians have told themselves. But what's interesting about them is that they're trying to suppress Native Americans, Mexican Americans, Chinese and Pacific Island Americans. African Americans too, but it's those groups and those groups have been missing from even this discussion about some of the histories that we need to deal with in terms of uh, broadening our understandings of reconstruction. So teachers, you should look for resources for those groups too, because they're also part of reconstruction and their presence in history in the United States, it's shaping what's happening in this moment. We're gonna have to do it again. We're gonna have to do part two to get us these histories and even get to the international complexions of the reconstruction story. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Promises. Yes, we'll do it. <laughs> um, one of the things that I want to just call out is that a number of the resources that you all have mentioned are resources where educators can 
fulfill their own learning as lifelong learners and then can also bring and use within their classroom. And I think that is so powerful that this list um, serves multiple um, serves multiple levels of what educators will be needing to do as they're uh, planning on teaching reconstruction in their classrooms. Um, we are we, we can roll into our Q and A section and portion of the evening. Um, as we're moving into this, I just want to give a shout out to our colleagues uh, Chelsea and Keith who are behind the scenes tonight making this program run smoothly. Just thank you so much to you both. Just wanted to make sure to express our gratitude for them. And I am pulling, um, I'm gonna pull the first question that I see here. And the question is coming from um, an audience member that says, how can I use primary sources to encourage students to not only learn about reconstruction, but to be curious about exploring more history on their own? Um, one thing I would mention just really quickly is that on Facing History's website, we have a whole section of teaching resources, I'm sorry, teaching strategies that are written up sort of uh, generically, so to speak, not for specific content. And there's a ton um, on there that is great exactly for this purpose. So text-based discussions, um, big paper and exercise where you have a resource up and students are processing it silently with their pens. So definitely take a look there and I think um, you'll find a lot that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just think that in my in my own classroom, I used uh, primary resources and primary documents to really disrupt master narratives that are just laced throughout the corporate textbooks. And I think one really interesting activity that you can do with students for reconstruction, but for any era, is to compare primary source documents of the time with what the textbook says about the era and have them compare and contrast that and have them try to understand why a Dunning School narrative uh, of a lost cause might be in this textbook versus the firsthand testimony of a black person fighting for their freedom during the era of reconstruction. And that helps them be able to develop the critical thinking and the, the skills that they need to disrupt master narratives and replace them with counter narratives. Right. right. And let's not forget that we have the other kind of primary sources from the, from the period are some of the things that Dr. Williams was talking about before. We've got novels, right? Charles Chestnut. We can go back into the house behind the cedars and other crucial novels from the period. I'm not going to go into a laundry list, but I think we can probably compile something. We can also think about the ways in which um, with black writers are getting at a, at a deeper truth around uh, from around reconstruction from more recent periods. Uh, I think that um, we were talking about CRT battles. Um, one of the most magnificent and uh, novels around the reconstruction period is Toni Morrison's Beloved. People think about that as a novel about slavery and memory, but it's set in the period of Reconstruction and has a lot to, a lot for us to think about in terms of people who are navigating their way during this world in a, in Ohio, um, and grappling with the the this psychic landscape of what they've come through. It's a it's a phenomenal way in, um, and there's young adult novels as well. One just came out this year, I believe that Zinn was helping to sort of profile in some of the work. Is that right? A, a novel for written for young people about that is doing some time travel and researching and reconstructing even as it's dealing with the period. Is that, am I right in that? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, tell us about that. Yes, by Michelle Coles, Black Was the Ink. Great. Yes, and we can, we um, actually did a uh, author's talk with her uh, through the museum. And so we can definitely also uh, link that and share. So I'll just add, there are a lot of resources, but the one thing I'll say is to, to go back to the very specific question is to encourage students to think about who's not represented in the source that they're examining, mm -hmm. right? 
who may not be, you know, you know, if you're only, if you're looking at like a cluster of records from say, you know, political speeches, um, political speakers like Frederick Douglass, I think it helps to ask students, you know, well, where will we have to go to figure out what women thought about this moment, right? Or about someone who wasn't free before the war thought about this moment. Um, and so you sort of, you know, encourage students to think about who's missing. Who do they want to hear from? They've heard from this person. They can understand their worldview. But who else might, you know, who is missing? And how might those other stories, those other voices, add a little bit of complexity to the story that we're learning at this moment? And I would just like to echo what everyone is saying. And also, as a history teacher uh, at high school, I like to think outside the box a little bit as well. And what I try to do is bring in primary sources of the time and try to connect that with a current cultural source. And so I use lyrics to songs, um, rap music, um, hip hop, and the message that they are portraying and connect that to the language of the time period of reconstruction. What's the reason for it? To get students engaged, right? And so I always believe that the voices of these artists today is similar to the voices of these individuals doing reconstruction. And that has been very impactful for students to really grapple of what's going on and it's easy for them to relate to it as well. So I just want to bring that to the forefront. Andrew, I see there was a there was a question about are there upcoming opportunities for teacher workshop for make good the promises for make good the promises. I know you had one this summer. Is there is there what does future opportunities look like? Well, future opportunities for. Um, Workshops around reconstruction, yes. <laughs> um, but as far as uh, workshops that are just, you know, kind of connected as as closely with the exhibition, we'll have to we'll be changing a little bit of how that looks because the exhibition, unfortunately, you know, is ending on Sunday. But the themes that are in the exhibition and the stories and the reason why we wanted to even have the exhibition in the first place is why we're having this conversation tonight. So this moment tonight, we are positing as the beginning of the rest of our work around reconstruction. And so we would just suggest that uh, if you all are out there as educators, please stay in touch with us, with our education department at the museum to find out about our upcoming workshops and our upcoming talks. We'll be doing some virtually. We've started to move back in person as well for certain things. So we'll have a lot of opportunities. And when I send around um, some of the links and lists to the registered, uh, to anybody that was registered on our list uh, for this program, I'll make sure to include places where you can find workshops and events from both our museum, from Facing History and Ourselves, as well as from Zen Education. So you'll have lots of opportunities, I think, to continue your education and to continue to have these conversations and discussions. Kendra, thank you for that. And you're right. I mean, the the while the exhibition is closing, the, the, the core themes of this exhibition, um, the need for the, the ongoing struggle for full freedom, justice and equality continues. And that's at the heart of what our museum is about in everything we do. And, you know, I began by talking about how the museum's birth is in ways a reconstruction story. The, mm -hmm. the people who had the original idea to craft um, this museum, what became this museum, were a group of, um, Civil War Black veterans and their families who, in 1915, over 100 years ago, who saw this erasure of their history from the national landscape and wanted to secure that true story to be told. And that is a part and a parcel of everything we do through our programs, through our exhibitions, um, telling African-American history through telling American history through the African-American lens. It is something that profoundly changes your viewpoint into history and its connection to today. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd really like to just ask our panelists, our educators, our teachers to take a moment and, and give you all the final word. Um, we're an educational institution. 
but we're an institution that prizes ourselves, I think, on, on two things. Let's call it three things. Telling the truth, telling the truth that is rooted in the best possible scholarship, and being in dialogue with our communities. So we're always learning. And so with that in mind, let me ask you all, um, and I'll call you one by one if you, if you wouldn't mind, to um, give us some parting words as we end this one moment and move on to the next. It could be an encouragement to do something else. It could be a reflection on something important that we've missed tonight. Um, let me begin with, with Dr. Williams. Um, I think what I would say is that we have, based upon what's happened and what is happening in this moment, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but we make it to the future. We honor the struggle of reconstruction by understanding the power of working together, um, by understanding the importance of small individual but consistent acts towards justice and truth on a regular basis. And so this isn't gonna be something that we're gonna be able to address really quickly to sort of roll back the problems that we're dealing with and the threats to our democracy. But I believe they will happen, but we have to sort of assume the, our responsibility for the work and to be consistent in it and to understand that we can only do this by working together and by keeping the truth alive. Amen. Kurt Russell? Yes, I'm so encouraged um, with the movement of studying reconstruction. Um, what I'm so encouraged about is we are moving from being equitable to being just. And I think when we move from that sphere of being comfortable with just being equitable to being just for voices to be heard and listened to, um, it's a great day. And I'm so, uh, first of all, fortunate to be on this panel and I'm so happy that we are having these discussions about reconstruction and about listening, listening to the voices of the past and how it shaped the future. Brother Jeremy. Wow, um, I just wanna say a personal thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with um, what Kadada, Dr. Williams was saying about the challenge in front of us and it is daunting. And at the same time, to be on this panel, to um, know that there are like-minded organizations like the museum, like the Zen Education Project, um, that there are teachers like Kurt uh, who are doing the work every day with students to tell a different story, to change the narrative that we've been giving and hopefully change our, our future for the better is something that gives me a great amount of hope. So I'm very grateful. Um, for everyone on this panel, for everyone that's come tonight, for all the incredible comments in the chat. And um, just want to say a really big thank you and keep it up, everybody. Um, we're doing great work and it's really important now more than ever. Mr. Jesse Higgopian. Yes, thanks so much for including me on this panel with so many people I, I've learned so much from over the years. It, it's a great honor. And I guess I'll just end where I began. You know, I would encourage people to look at their own history and the their own family legacy and see how it connects to this era of reconstruction. It was really incredible for me. Uh, I've learned so much about myself and about this country by by looking at my own family's connection to this this time period. And I think it, it made it much more vivid and real for me. And I also just think that this time period has so many lessons for us as we struggle for the right to vote all over again with all these voter suppression laws that are going into place. And as we struggle uh, for the right to learn about systemic racism, right? There's so many lessons of the struggle for black education that come out of this time period that we are going to need desperately if we're going to win the struggles to come. Yes, sir. And last but not least, my brilliant partner in crime, I want to thank you for bringing us all together. Um, not just this evening, Kendra Flanagan, but over and over again um, on these important topics for, for the museum, for our nation. 
um, you get the final word. <laughs> well, my final word will be one of gratitude. Um, this has been, it feels like a full circle journey, journey for me. Um, I am so pleased to be able to sit in this, this space, space and commune with all of these passionate people here around a topic that's just near and dear to our hearts and minds. Jesse, Jeremy, Kadata, Kurt, thank you all so much for lending your thoughts and experiences and voices to echo um, something that Kurt has been, you know, instilling in us uh, as a part of this conversation tonight, um, to lending your voices to this conversation. And I just want to say to our audience out there that I hope that for all of the educators that have joined us and that you found a phrase or a word or a story that's really going to inspire you to continue to seek out and share the fuller story of reconstruction. Doing this work uh, really enriches us individually, it enriches our communities, and it enriches our future. And so we just want to say thank you for spending time with us. Um, to you, Paul, and to all of our colleagues on the Make Good the Promises exhibition team, it has been a pleasure thinking with you all, learning from you all, and sharing the pride of shining a light on the unvarnished truth around reconstruction. So thank you all so much for that. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping as we close, you're gonna get a link to an evaluation that's gonna be coming your way. And we hope that you'll take a moment as our audience to fill it out and share your thoughts with us and educators. We know it's important to count those uh, hours of continuing education. So if you wanna receive a letter of verification, uh, you can do that through this survey as well. And that link should be coming to you all. Uh, my heart, my mind, my soul is full tonight. I thank you all so much. I, I have a new reading list uh, ready to go. And I, I just, I'm so grateful for this event. And I'm so grateful that this for me has been the coda of our education experience uh, in support of Make Good the Promises. So thank you all so much. Um, I, I just, I can't say it enough. I appreciate your time. You've been brilliant. Thank you, Kanja. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, good night everybody.